Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for yet another Discover Wildlife evening. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Dan Free, and I'm the General Manager here at Wildlife Worldwide and the Travelling Naturalist. And this evening, I'm joined by um, two very uh, talented uh, individuals in Emma Healy and Brett Charman, uh, both are superb wildlife photographers. And tonight, we're going to be hearing from them about UK wildlife photography. Um, obviously, over the past couple of years, um, the UK has become more and more important to us from a you know, wildlife watching and, and photography perspective. And we now offer an extensive range of UK trips, uh, over 50 in total, and, and many of these are photography focused. So this evening, we're going to be hearing uh, about some of our most popular UK trips and specifically about some of the trips that Emma and Brett have been most heavily involved with. Now, as I said, they are very talented individuals uh, and so we're in for a treat tonight and uh, we'll surely see some superb images. Now, as ever, there will be the option to ask questions um, either as we're going along or I'll pitch them to Emma or Brett at the end of the evening and you can do that either through the Q&A forum or indeed through the chat forum. Um, and typically, um, you know, as we usually do, there'll also be the opportunity to uh, request travel plans for any of the trips that may be of interest. And that'll be through the poll, which will launch at the end of the talks. Uh, initially, Emma's going to be talking for around 20 minutes, and then we're going to pass over to Brett. So hopefully that will all go smoothly. Um, and on that note, I'll pass over to you, Em. Perfect. Thanks, Dan. Great stuff. Good evening, everybody. Um, nice to see you again. Um, so we're going to be chatting, as Dan said, about all of the, well, some of our UK wildlife photography um, workshops. We've got a number which we've obviously developed more of over the last couple of years. Um, and so I'll be talking you through a couple of ones that I've been quite involved with and then um, one of the other ones, and then Brett's going to take you through some more. Um, but really, I think it's, you know, we've we've had to be in the UK for the last couple of years, but I think while that has made us get out and explore more and do stuff because we have to, I think it's made us also realise that there is so much here that we don't really make the most of. Um, so even though people are travelling again, it's actually still a really good thing to, um, to do, whether you're practising or just want to get out and see some great things. Um, so the first one I'm going to look at is the Hampshire bird photography, um, which is down in some hides near Winchester, um, and it's set behind a car garage, it's quite random, um, but it's a fantastic bit of land where there are four hides in total. Um, two of them are set back um, and have a reflection pool and focus on woodland birds. Um, that can be anything, anything, anything from great number of tits. So you get long-tailed tits, um, chiff chaffs, gold finches, blue tits, um, and, uh, what's quite important here and as you'll see from the different images is the different um, kind of setups that you can have so you can either so some of those first ones were just on the willow branches and I actually quite like that natural approach but you have various different um, perches for them to sit on like this mossy log um, and they kind of fly around and there's different places for them to get food from and seeds but they will just land in various places and it's you know you're in a hide and you can reposition yourself and have a play and it's just great because during the day you're there all day and you know anything can come and and pop up so you're you have the opportunity really to kind of hone down your skills and move around and just get some really nice shots um so you get depending on the time of year you get different birds coming um, but really good opportunities to to take things that you wouldn't normally see um, obviously, if you go during the spring and summer months, you have more opportunities to, to play around with things like this. So you get the blossoms coming and the bullfinches and the chaffinches really like to, to sit on there. It just gives you something a bit different. Um, and greenfinches tend to come and stand by the, the pool. And then you even get the opportunity really to, to see things like this, where you get a bit of activity because you're sat there for a while. Um, you just see them prancing around. And so quite often when, when the starlings came um, towards the end of the year, they were fighting and it gave everybody a really good opportunity to practice kind of birds in flight because they fight each other just above the pond. Um, so it's just a really nice way to see some different birds. And um, Dan will hate this, but um, this pheasant occasionally comes to visit and we do tend to try and shoo it away. But I just think it gives you that fantastic opportunity where 
normally it would be a head in you know a field really far away but you get to see that detail that you wouldn't normally be able to see you also get woodpeckers coming um and green um so you do get green woodpecker green woodpeckers as well and the really nice thing about it is that the background uh, the bushes in the background are quite far away so you can really get this really nice blown out background um and if you're lucky you know you, you can get anything um popping up so kestrels um used to be fairly regular visitors fair sometimes less now but you just never know what's going to come in um this was obviously in autumn so you get that really nice brown color behind but also you can get them anytime throughout the year where you get greener you can this is on a i think slightly later in autumn but actually the sun had already passed so you know it makes that real nice dark background so the bird pops out we did only once don't don't get your hopes up but we did once have a little owl pop up um so you really can get anything um and also sitting in the hide um just to the left a fox came out of the bushes so yeah it's just a fantastic place to to spend a day and you just never know really what you're going to see um obviously i wasn't going to do a talk without any rodents so <laughs> i'm just going to pop a few of these in here but the rats do tend to visit the reflection pool um so you can play around and it's a really nice way again to practice to you know especially for if you're heading somewhere like a rainforest you know something like this is brilliant because you can practice on getting the rat in focus through the leaves um so it's just a really nice place to go and have a play to be honest then the other hide is really focused on kingfisher. So whereas that one is um, really good variety of birds, the kingfisher hide is pretty much only a kingfisher. You may get um, a grey lapwing um, and a couple of others, but to be honest, you're focusing on the kingfisher. So there's a lot of different things that you can do in there. And what it tends to be with our workshops, we'll do one day in, in one or the two woodland hides and then one day in the kingfisher hide. So um, and the leader who's with you will tend to stay in the kingfisher hide. So it gives you that full day to just have a bit of a play, get some different images. You know, it depends on the light, the weather, everything. But there's some really nice portrait shots that you can get, various perches. Um, and again, it depends on the light, the background, um, where the bird decides to sit, the direction it sits in. Obviously, you don't know what it's going to do, but they're fairly regular visitors. I mean, most days on a good day, they'll come every 20 to 30 minutes um so it gives you the opportunity to just try some different things and that was obviously the same perch but in different seasons so you can even come back and do it a couple of times and get completely different shots um i really people always say oh god it's going to rain it's going to be terrible i don't want to go i really like rainy days because it lets you be a little bit um adventurous and i'll come back to that later why um it also gives you the opportunity if you kind of lean out a little bit because they're a bit more um used to people you can get more natural shots like this so you don't have to use the perches that are there um so it just means that you can get some really nice images of a bird that normally you just kind of see as a blue flash um and also you can be a bit creative so this was obviously a very dull day um and the bird just came and sat on the the branch in front of us and it was much brighter behind so then you can start playing with different techniques like silhouettes um, and the lovely thing about it is you get to spend time just watching them and they will fish and then just come and sit for maybe 20 minutes sometimes, not, you know, not all the time, but it's a really nice way to watch their behaviour. So they'll preen themselves, have a bit of a stretch. Um, and I captured a, a sequence of what they tend to do. They'll have the fish and then they regurgitate a pellet of all of the bits that they don't need. Um, and you can kind of tell they're about to do it. So if you if you spot them doing the first bits, you can catch it. So if you just have a look, that's the beginning. So you'll see them kind of lift their neck. You can see it just coming out of its mouth. And then it's down on the sign there. So they do that probably, well, normally a couple of times a day, but if you're lucky, they'll do it while they're there. And it's just a really nice, a bit of different behavior to capture. And then going in for the dive, this is kind of the shot. These are the shots that everyone, not this one, um, but these are the shots that everybody really wants. Um, and obviously a lot of it depends on the weather on the day. It's better when it's brighter. Um, you know, this, I've only been able to capture one like this once and I've been there a number of times, but it just, you know, it all kind of has to come together. Um, and even though you've got all your settings right, it's not always perfect. And I know a lot of people who will have done this workshop will feel the same. Um, but when it does come together, it's great. And despite being there, however many times I have, I've never got the same picture twice. Um, so again, it's something you can do again and again, and just have 
very different experiences. Um, <clears throat> so we'll go in and grab a fish um, and fly off with it whichever direction. I really love it when it comes out like that. <laughs> um, but you see sometimes you get the splash, sometimes it's clean out, you get the shape in the wings. Um, so you just, it's just lovely to watch them. Sometimes they miss. Um, but when they've caught the fish, they'll tend to go and sit on the perch. Um, so you get to see them then with the behavior after that. So they'll tend to bash the fish around on the, the branch. Um, and then they flick it around and they'll turn it so that the face, uh, the head of the fish faces down and then they'll gulp it down. So it's just, it's a really nice thing to be able to, to watch that normally you wouldn't be able to see. And then you learn their behavior as well. So after they've eaten the fish, they'll shake twice normally, once kind of like this, and then they'll give themselves a bit of a shimmy. So you can kind of get some quite fun shots. It just gives it a bit of character. Um, so this is going back to the rain. And I just wanted to put this in, especially when, you know, it's a bit of a dull day, you're in a hide, you're feeling a bit negative, you can't get the dive shot you want, but actually that's the kind of time when we can talk about skills and, you know, where doing a photography workshop, I think comes into its own. So one of the things that we do sometimes, especially when people don't know how their camera works necessarily, or are trying to get off auto mode onto manual, um, when it's raining, this is fantastic. So this was taken on 1600th of a second. So all of these are on the same, every other setting except the speed. And I just changed the speed down. So going from 1600, this is going to 1250th of a second and then a thousandth. And what you should be able to see is just the start of the drops getting longer. So obviously the longer shutter speeds letting you have that longer um, raindrop. Um, and also it lets more light in, so it gets a bit brighter. So that's 800th and 640th and then 400th and then finally 250th. You can really see the longer um, drops on there. So it's just a really nice way and I've done nothing else to them. So they're, they're not the best, but it just gives you that indication of how that makes a difference. And that's only changing one thing. So, you know, when we've got time, it's just really nice to be able to go through things like that. Um, so yeah, recommend, really recommend it. It's a lovely couple of days um, and we can do it as a tailor-made trip as well. So um, let us know if you're keen. Um, so Red Kite and Night Sky Photography is a workshop that Sean Weekly runs up in Elan Valley um, where he lives up in the most beautiful part of Wales. Um, so this, the Elan Valley has been um, designated as a dark sky, well, given a dark sky park award. Um, it is the most incredible place. So you can get out and do some landscapes. So anyone who likes waterfalls, it's brilliant for that. Um, and Sean's brilliant with his kind of wide angle getting in there and, and getting all the lovely flowing water. So if that's something that interests you, that can be a part of it as well. But really the main focus is the red kites. So it's set up at Giggerin Farm. Um, some of you may have been, and they've got a couple of hides there um, to focus on the 400 or so kites that come in every day. So they leave food out and the kites come in. You have the opportunity to, to take images as they're coming towards um, the food. This was one of my favorite ones of Sean's. It just, I think all came together for him on this day and there was a rainbow and the massive storm and it was just the most beautiful shot. Um, but what Sean's done is he's actually built a ground level hide in the farm so that you can really get down an eye level with, um, with the birds. So anything from the buzzards to the red kites, it just gives you that really different angle to be able to get down and and get some different images that you know normally you see them flying above your car but it's um it's a really nice way to spend a couple of days really kind of watching them and getting to know them um, and then you also get out and about in the valley and one of the other um real draws of this workshop is kind of as well as the landscapes the night sky photography so as we said you know you can see how open it is very little light pollution and these workshops are run when there's a new moon um, so that you get the best stars. Um, uh, and so Sean will take you through how to get the best out of that so you can see the Milky Way. Um, sometimes it'll be single images that are just you know, left on a tripod for a certain amount of time. Sometimes it's a panorama of different shots, um, but there's loads of different ways to do it. And it's just a great way to just have a bit of a play with different techniques that you hadn't normally done. Um, as part of this trip, uh, there is also a half a day um, dolphin cruise as well on a private boat. Um, so it's just a really nice variety of things to do. It's a three night trip um, up in Wales. Um, so yeah, definitely a good one to check out if you want to try a few different things. 
Um, and finally, for me, I'm going to take you through a bit of macro. Um, so over the last couple of years, we've been running a bit of a, a variety. So some fungi workshops and some more bug focused ones. Um, and I want to take you through the fungi, even though I'm not sure this year we're going to be able to um, with diaries, but we will get some in again because they're great fun. Um, so we tend to go down to the new forest um, and really just explore. So we just go in and see what we can find. and um, I really prefer anything smaller the better. Um, so we're looking at logs um, and stones and anything on the floor. But what I really look for is the background. So as you walk through the forest, you'll see the light behind it. So you'll see kind of the sun reflected onto the leaves, whether it's raining or whether they're just bright. So this I think was a rainy day, but the sun just hits those leaves and you'll look at it and think, oh, I, I, don't, I don't see it. But as soon as you look through your lens, it just makes this incredible bokeh and that's, the same with any of these that it was you know this was an autumn day where it'd been raining it's just when the sun hits it that it this sort of magic happens so we'll look for things like that and then there's um like these these are probably about half a half a centimeter of that tall um just the most incredible things that you'll find um and you can try different techniques like focus stacking and masking and you know we're there to talk you through any of that um and anything, you know, this was the same candle snuff fungus just after a really horrible rainstorm. Um, but you see the light behind it just brings everything to life. And that's the same fungus a couple of weeks later, but obviously um, the leaves are turned and it just gives it a completely different look. Um, and then this is one of my favorite things that I focus on, especially if people are new to macro because they don't necessarily know what their lens can do. Um, and often I'll come up and they'll have, you know, a whole stump in front of them and I'm like, no, 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 get closer, get closer. So I'm, I'm terrible because I'll push people sort of into bushes and just, so this is just two tiny, you know, spores of moss that are just on top of a tree trunk. And you just get, you know, you can get within a couple of inches of them and it just shows you what your lens can do. Um, and it, you know, it's partly making a landscape out of kind of a, a tiny space really. So it's good fun. Um, and the same with this, you know, that's inside a tree trunk, but it just makes it, you know, you, you make it look like a, a big landscape. Um, so yeah, so it's great fun and we try different techniques um, and basically just explore the forest really. Um, have a bit of a play with lighting, so flashes, backlighting, um, off camera lighting, reflectors, all sorts of things. Um, so for example, that was taken with a reflector underneath it so we could get the light underneath the, the gills. Um, and we'll look for really tiny things. I mean, I think that's probably about half a centimetre um, and we tend to be lifting lots of leaf litter. So yeah, it can get a bit messy. Um, but when you lift the bark, you do tend to get um, living things kind of in there that don't necessarily want to be found, but are, are pretty good fun. So we found some, um, some centipedes, some dung beetles, all sorts. Um, and what I love about macro really is that it just lets you get close on things that you would just normally not really even look at. Um, so I'll get to that a bit with the bugs, but this particularly, these are um, wasp galls on the bottom of a, um, an oak leaf and they're absolutely tiny, but once you get the macro lens on them with the proper lighting and everything, it just brings out all the detail in them. So um, again, shows you really what it can do. Um, and then looking at a bit kind of further away, so going more towards the spring summer, which is probably what we're going to be focusing on more this year. Um, looking at how you can really separate those flowers, bugs, whatever it is that you're looking for um, and make the most of your lens and just be a bit creative. It lets you just have a bit of fun out there. Um, so this was in a, a field of just grasses. Um, this bee orchid was coming up. So it's partly kind of um, isolating it in, in the field and just making the most of it. So we'll look at different ways of doing that as well. Um, so then really it's looking at all the tiny things. So I will be wandering around lifting leaves, looking into corners and just see what you can find really. So um, a number of caterpillars and it's really good, especially when, if it's a dull day, um, these kind of caterpillars are fantastic because when they're quite hairy or spiky, you can pay, play with lighting. So you can look at backlighting and we can talk through different techniques for that as well. Um, this guy was amazing. I just, I just happened to catch his feet because I thought, six don't have feet but otherwise I just never would have seen it um, but that's a buff tip buff tip moth caterpillar um, so you just never know what you're going to find it's a bit of an ex exploration um, of wildlife um, 
And then this one was a pest moth caterpillar, a pale tussock moth caterpillar that we found in the New Forest um, that is just the cutest thing and everybody had a really good time with him. Um, and then if you're lucky, especially during the spring and summer, if it's warm, you might see common lizards that tend to kind of come back to the same spot. So if we do find one, we can hang around for a bit and if you're quiet, they'll tend to, to pop back. So you can have some fun with them. Um, beautiful, beautiful demoiselles. So um, they tend to be near the water, but if we can, you know, get a day where the sun is like that, it just brings that color out of them and they're stunning. Um, and then we get onto the really small stuff. So this is a scorpion fly. Um, now, some of these are natural light and some of them are taken with flash. This, for example, would be taken with flash because um, it's a really dark um, leafy bit, but I can talk you through what I use as well. But for this, I'll use a flash and a soft box, um, which is an off camera. Um, soldier beetles so for example that one was taken with natural light on a sunny day so you know we we work with what we've got really um i like to get really tiny so this is a weevil on a um on a gorse bush so you think how tiny the gorse flower is and how tiny that weevil is but they're absolutely minuscule but very sweet um this doesn't necessarily look like it should be in the uk but this was taken near guildford um and it's a hazel weevil. So if you see any hazel trees, it's worth keeping an eye out. And they do tend to stand out because obviously you don't normally see bright red things, but I just think they're so cute. Um, makes you feel like you're in Madagascar. Um, and then leaf hoppers, which are tiny and an absolute nightmare to capture because they will always fly away. But if you stay very still, um, they tend to live on rhododendron bushes or in tall grasses. Um, and they're really good to photograph. They're just very cute if they actually do sit still long enough. Um, and then you get things like this, which are even smaller. So this is kind of in the head of an unfurling fern, um, a plant of a nymph. Um, and, you know, if you go back, especially a few weeks in a row, you can really see them develop. Um, and this was also in the new forest, actually. This is a lacewing larvae under there somewhere. So that's its head on the right hand side underneath. And they use all this forest debris to protect them from predators. So you just kind of suddenly see some lichen start moving and it, it's really confusing, um, but they're just incredible to watch, very speedy. Um, and this is also something I look out for kind of anything with prey. So this um, shield bug was eating this caterpillar and this was the angle it was at. So it was actually holding on to that caterpillar. So I don't know how heavy it was, but um, it's obviously been to the gym. Um, and some weevils, which well, again don't look like they should really be in the UK but this was um, locally again near Guildford just on a um, near some nettles in a in some bushes um, and then they are invasive but um, I struggled to be cross with them because they're really cute um, and these are one of my favorite things to photograph so these are bush crickets um, come out normally kind of May June time and get bigger throughout the year but this is really when they when it was quite young and I love the way you can see all their spikes on their legs and their back and, you know, their eyes look enormous, but they're fantastic fun. Um, throughout the season, you can see there, that one's a little bit older. It's got less um, spikes. Um, wasps, so when the flowers come out, we can do wasps. Um, bees, I did think this was dead until it flew towards my face, um, but it was just sitting there like that. I think it was just enjoying the sunshine. Um, so I did give it a bit of water just in case, but um, it was fine. Um, this is my, my cheeky uh, bit too late for Valentine's Day, but my thick-headed fly threesome um, that were just sitting on a, um, on a flower as we're walking through, I think it was a blackberry flower, um, walking through a common. So you just, this is one of these things that with macro, I really love because you normally will walk, and especially over the last couple of years, I think a lot of us will have been walking a lot. When you actually stop and start looking closer and get in there, you can't help but notice it. And it just, the bushes come to life. So it's it's good fun. Um, right, I'm gonna talk about just a few spiders before I finish. So anyone who is scared might be worth looking away now. Um, I am a bit of, was, don't know. I'm not sure if I'm reformed yet, but I was an arachnophobe. I was absolutely terrified. Couldn't even look at a picture of them. Um, and macro photography has honestly cured me of it. Um, I love going looking for spiders now, which is ridiculous and my mum can't believe it, but anything from these little um, crab spiders, they just, you know, they look like a leaf and you can hardly see them. Um, but once you get close up to them, just brings out all their detail, the hairs and their legs and their eyes. Um, and it's just really good. It's just really good fun. Um, and these are my favorite things. So I thought I'd finish on them, but jumping spiders, they're normally about half a centimeter of that. Um, and you get different types. So this one's a, 
female, I believe, and this one's a male zebra jumping spider. Um, and they tend to be um, facing the other way. Um, but if you do sort of surprise them or flash them, they'll normally give you a quick couple of seconds before they jump off somewhere else. But um, they're just wonderful and I'm always sort of head in bush looking for them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great day out, bit different. Um, hopefully the weather will be nice. Um, and it's a good way to just see the world in a different way. So this was actually, I was actually following the wasp that is just on the left um, and thinking it might land on a leaf. And then unfortunately it landed right in this web and the spider just grabbed it and started wrapping it up. And I think it took it probably about 20 seconds and then it was wrapped. But I was sort of messing around with the flash and you can see the web coming out of it. So, you know, we had the opportunity to just capture stuff that you just wouldn't normally think you could. Um, and that's one good thing about using flash on these. So yeah, good way to learn new techniques and have a bit of fun in the forest. Um, we haven't got any of those set up at the moment, but we're just looking to set some up in May and June. So I've left my email address there and we will be in touch obviously as soon as we do set some up. Um, but yeah, let us know if you have any questions. And that's all from me. I'm gonna hand over to Brett. Thank you very much, Emma. Amazing pictures. Thanks for sharing them with us all. Um, right, so bear with me a second. I'm just going to take over the screen. Um, so hopefully you should be able to see. And hopefully you can all see my screen now. So yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Brett Charman. Uh, I'm a tour leader for Wildlife Worldwide, and I also work in their marketing department as well. Um, so I'm going to talk you through four different trips, and I'm going to start off very close to home in the New Forest uh, on our deer photography workshop, which we created a few years ago. Um, one of the reasons we created it, to be honest, was because everybody seems to go to the Royal Deer Parks in London, sort of Richmond and, uh, you know, those sorts of places to photograph deer and some other people further north go to some other deer parks and we thought actually you know what it'd be really nice if we can photograph some wild deer in the UK um, and so we created this and it visits a beautiful area uh, in the heart of the new forest and actually this year uh, I won't be leading it um, but it's in very capable in the very capable hands of Ben Sutcliffe um, who's a Hampshire local uh, and knows the site incredibly well and has great experience with deer too. So anyway, I'm going to give you an idea of exactly what's on offer um, on this wonderful workshop. And the area itself, just to warn you, is prone to flooding. So it gets quite waterlogged. And normally this isn't a problem. We can manoeuvre around the waterlogged areas. Um, but it can also provide some fantastic opportunities for photography. These are actually fallow deer. Um, so they aren't native to the UK, but they're in the New Forest in large numbers. Here you've got three, there's actually one mature female in the middle and two younger ones either side. The one on the right actually has leucism, um, so she hasn't got the proper pigmentation. Uh, they are all females though, but beautiful, beautiful deer, uh, and the males too are very handsome indeed. Obviously by going in the autumn, we time it to coincide with the rut, and we try actually not to go during the peak sort of rutting period so as not to disturb them too much, and um, we don't want to put them on under any unnecessary pressure. Uh, and we work very closely with Forestry England as well, it's very important to say, um, and we have all the permissions in place to work within the forest itself. Um, but I think the highlight for most people when they go to the forest is actually the red deer. Um, and the red deer here are only one of two free roaming populations in southern England, the other is on Exmoor. Um, and these are native mammals, um, and so they are absolutely incredible, uh, and without a doubt, the focus of our day-long day workshops. They only last a day. We don't provide accommodation on these at all. Um, so what we do is we meet first thing in the morning. And the idea for that is to enable the opportunity to make the most of the sunrise and the beautiful, hopefully misty mornings and, and frost that you can get. Um, hopefully uh, get a scene such as this, where we've got a lovely male stag bellowing across the heathland. Um, with the morning mist and it really was quite a, a beautiful morning uh, and so we do get lucky sometimes but more typically I have to say you will get them sort of in their environment and whereas I know in deer parks in the UK you can get incredibly close full frame portraits despite the fact you're supposed to keep certain distance um, in the new forest I'd say it's much more about capturing shots of these beautiful mammals in the environment so the red deer here um, will behave very much as they always have um, for the most part, up until maybe the last couple of years, they were unknown 
um, to the majority of people that visited the new forest. Um, and sort of, it's just really special seeing them in a large open forested landscape. Uh, and one of the things you may or may not know is that forest doesn't mean trees, it means a protected area, uh, actually a royal hunting area originally. Um, and so it's a mosaic of habitats of open heathland, woodland, sort of bracken areas, um, and then sort of also some plantations as well of, of conifers and things like that. But it really is a, a fantastic place to base yourself uh, and spend a day photographing these really, really handsome mammals. Uh, and we can really capture sort of a range of different scenes. As I said, in these plantations here, these are, are Scots pines, um, and then the traditional sort of wetland forest um, that sort of proliferates in this area, full of silver birch and oak trees. Um, it really is a, a really beautiful landscape. And what's great as well in the autumn is obviously those colors start to change. Uh, and that makes it really, really special. You can get close on occasions. What we normally do is we work our way towards them. So the start of the day, I'd say typically you keep more of a distance and then over the course of the day, try and build up some trust with them. Don't push them. Um, they know you're there, obviously it's very hard to avoid them, but don't put them under unnecessary pressure. If you start trying to creep up on them uh, by sort of creeping through the gorse and things like that, um, they very quickly will disappear because they think you're some sort of crazed lunatic. Um, but you can get some amazing pictures and you can start to use that landscape and the, the sort of the foliage around you as well to start to frame your subjects and, and really build up a wonderful portfolio of images. And it can be hard going, there's no denying it, there's a lot of walking involved. Um, the deer are completely wild, completely free roaming. So wherever they go, we sort of try and stick with them. Uh, and then during the middle of the day, there's a, a lovely sort of little village nearby where you can retreat um, for a cup of tea or coffee if you need to, or you can of course bring a packed lunch, things like that. But it's, it's a great, great place and a beautiful landscape in the new forest. And here just gives you an idea of those autumnal colors um, and this is what the ground is like underfoot to give you an idea. So grassy areas, bracken, then you've got those trees and actually the deer are at the very top of that screen and we're just slowly making our way closer. Um, I generally don't sort of photograph people next to the deer um, because I don't want sort of strangers to start running up to deer and thinking it's okay. Um, but it, after lunch, what I say is that the deer are actually slightly more relaxed. Um, they kind of have learned that you're not a threat um, and hopefully we can start to sort of proceed and get closer and closer uh, and end up fingers crossed with some really really lovely portraits um it is just a, a waiting game and patience and really listen to ben um, or if i am leading one myself um, and they will do their absolute best to get you in the right place ideally you want the deer to come to you so you try and position yourself accordingly um, and try and make the most of those gorgeous moments when the light uh, the deer uh, and the landscape all come together. And if you're really, really lucky, um, you might get some action as well of two stags fighting. Uh, and when that happens, it is particularly exciting. So you get something like this, where everything comes together. You get the mist and the lovely warm light of, in this case, a sunrise, um, and then the sort of the silhouette and, and the deer sort of in full combat mode. So it really is a very special place. Um, and I, I openly admit, it isn't the easiest in terms of accessibility. Um, you do need to be fit uh, and be prepared to sort of get a little bit dirty, so to speak, um, just going across some quite uneven terrain and things like that, but it's well worth it. Uh, and if you want to photograph wild deer that probably, I guess, aren't in the Highlands in Scotland, then this is probably the easiest um, place you can do it uh, with some expert sort of local knowledge. Um, so from there, I'm going to take you somewhere else where there are red deer as well. Um, it's not so well known for them, um, but I'm going to take you to the Isle of Mole. Um, these are not my images. All the ones that you've just seen were, um, but these are all taken by um, either Nick Garber or Alex Hyde. And um, basically, this is a trip that encompasses, I'd say, all aspects of photography. So Isle of Mole is a very diverse place. It's got all sorts of wonderful wildlife. Um, and probably one of the big draws is actually the Treshness now. Treshness I can't speak trash in this. I, I, I really can't speak aisles um, off the coast of Mole. And they are a fantastic place to photograph puffins. Um, I mean, honestly, when you get close to a puffin, there really is nothing better. It's a wonderful, wonderful experience. They're such charismatic little birds, a lot smaller probably than most people actually realize. Um, and these islands, as well as somewhere else, which I'll show you shortly, are undoubtedly some of the very best places to photograph them. So there will be the opportunity to get on the islands, 
to get up and close uh, and, and really practice your photography, whether that be birds in flight, uh, on land, full frame portraits, um, there really will be countless opportunities. And you can even start to do beautiful wide angles as well um, and, and really capture the magic of these these charismatic little birds they're called clowns of the sea um, and when you see them in person you really you can't sort of argue with it they it's so aptly named they are the most gorgeous little things real characters um and a photographer's dream as well because they're inquisitive nature uh, and sort of the striking plumage as well of course moa has a lot more to it than just the puffins um, along the coastal areas in particular um you have a very good chance of seeing the white-tailed seagulls um, that were re reintroduced and uh, using a, a dedicated boat trip is, is the best, best chance to photograph these incredible birds of prey. Um, the opportunities are very much dependent on the birds themselves, obviously, but working with the boat, um, you have a good chance of, of achieving some fantastic photography opportunities. And, and as well as them, there are opportunities to enjoy the landscapes. Um, it's an amazing area. Uh, and, and even the local towns, uh, uh, well, villages, I should say, they're not really towns, are incredibly charismatic. Um, and, and there are endless opportunities, whether you're passionate about wildlife photography, landscape or macro or even botanic photography. Um, you know, there are real opportunities to, to practice and hone your skills. And Alex Hyde and Nick Garber are absolutely fantastic um, at helping you get the best out of your equipment uh, and learning techniques that you might not have ever even thought of before. Um, so obviously that previous picture was a hedgehog and um, this is a sundew and you can start to play with long exposures as well. So the sundew is obviously macro and there's even a chance maybe to do some marine photography, these beautiful jellies, um, just fantastic diversity uh, and amazing photography opportunities. And why would you not want to go when you've got a leader uh, such as Alex Hyde? Um, him and Nick work brilliantly together uh, and they'll help you make the most of, of this beautiful part of the UK. Um, I really highly recommend it. I'd love to go on it myself. Um, so if you're interested, uh, that's something to definitely take note of. I said there's another place to go for puffins, uh, and that's Skomer Island. Um, if, so if you're in the south of the UK, um, obviously the Island Mole's quite quite a long way away. Um, you could always head to Pembrokeshire, um, and basically we do a two night stay on Skomer Island itself, so no day visits. Um, and it enables you to spend some quality time making the most of morning and evening light, um, photographing arguably the UK's sort of most popular bird other than the robin, I suppose. Um, and this year, this trip, I, I normally lead this one as well, um, but due to other commitments, I won't be. Um, so I set this up maybe five years ago now, and it's one of our most popular tours. Um, and it will be led by Ben Sutcliffe again, um, who many of you will now know. Uh, and Kevin Morgans, who some of you may have heard of, uh, but don't know him personally. And Kevin Morgans is probably the king of puffins. Um, he's actually just about to release a book on puffins. And he also uh, won the Bird Photographer of the Year portfolio with a portfolio of puffins, which is no mean feat, I can tell you, because competitions hate pictures of puffins because they see so many of them. But these guys will be brilliant throughout and will be the perfect guides to help you make the most of Skomer Island. And what's great is by going on an overnight stay where you get the opportunity to spend time is you can just be picky and really go to town on your puffin photography. There are endless, endless opportunities, thousands and thousands of puffins. And in fact, the colony of puffins on Skomer Island has grown for the last two years, which is bucking a global trend. So that's fantastic news. Uh, and partly due to a fantastic marine reserve um, that's been put around the, the coastline of West Pembrokeshire and off the coast of Skoma itself. Um, but the, the portrait opportunities, which is probably what I'm best known for, are, are fantastic. Um, and you can play around and you don't need long lenses either. Um, wide angle, this one was taken at 300 mil to give you an idea, but 70 to 200 can even work. Even wide angles, you can get some amazing wide angle pictures as well. But by spending time with the birds, you can start to really capture their personalities those little beautiful moments like this one where it picked up a stick um, that was blocking its burrow. And you can start to build an impressive portfolio. Of course, people want to capture images of, uh, of the puffin with the, the fish in the beak in its bill. Uh, and it's hard work to be honest, because normally when they land, they run straight for their burrow, 
to feed their chicks. So to actually get them sat around like this is quite unusual. And it's normally because they got lost. Um, so you get lucky and one gets lost and it's sort of trying to work out exactly where it is before it finds its way to its burrow. Um, but there will be countless opportunities to photograph puffins. So much so that actually during the middle of the day, um, I would say it's probably best not to photograph the puffins. There can be day visitors on the island um, and the puffin activity in the middle of the day is lower but there's plenty more on offer on SCOMA other than the puffins. There is a really healthy population of gray seals. They actually pup on the beaches in, in a lovely little cove that they have, um, and they're incredibly inquisitive. So sometimes what my favorite thing to do is to go to the east of the island for sunrise. You can go down the steps all the way down the cliffs to the water's edge, um, and then you can get really close to the resident seals, and they're really, really inquisitive, really naughty, and you can sort of get some amazing pictures. If you're incredibly brave, uh, you might want to go for a swim in the water. It's very cold, um, but that is sometimes a, an option if it's safe to do so. Um, that's very much at the island's discretion, I should say. But there's other bird life around as well. Loads of different corvids, actually. It's a fantastic place for corvids. There are jackdaws, there are crows, uh, ravens, and the chuff. The red-billed chuff is obviously one of the, the most popular. Um, but there's large numbers of wading birds on the island. Oyster catchers breed pretty much all over. It is a fantastic place for Manx Shearwater. Um, it's actually got one of the largest, I think the largest population of Manx Shearwater anywhere in the world breeding. Um, but I don't have any pictures because I'm usually the one holding a red light um, and they no longer allow flash photography to protect the birds. So I have never actually photographed them. I've always been sort of the guide helping other people get pictures. Um, but there's so much more again, as I said, so loads of seabirds, there's guillemots galore, um, there's kitty wakes, full mars, um, and these guys razor bills. And again, at sunrise or sunset, you can get into position to get the amazing light and the depth of field and the bokeh behind. Um, it's, it's a fantastic place to go. And of course, you can get your more typical portraits as well. I would say, though, as I said, during the middle of the day, there's a lot more on offer. The, the highlight, if you're particularly if you're going in May, early June, um, are these guys, the shorted owls. They're diurnal, so they're active all day, which is fantastic. When they've got chicks, they're hunting all day. They're after the endemic scoma vole. Um, and you can very quickly build up quite an amazing array of imagery um, of these beautiful, beautiful birds. And if you're really lucky and you go, I would say early in May, uh, mid-May, you can get them in the bluebells as well. Um, and it's not just bluebells, you get red campion on the island. Um, so you can get really, really lucky um, and get some amazing floral displays that just make the whole thing really quite magical. The island is home to an awful lot of rabbits, and I mean an awful lot. A lot of them are black as well, I should say, um, but they are very photographic. And actually, this was very early on in the season. This was a sort of early April, I believe. Um, so the vegetation hasn't grown up yet, but it gives you an idea of how close you can get. Um, and even the endemic scoma vole, if you're really, really lucky, sometimes they all pop out in front of you. Um, and you can get some beautiful, beautiful photographs of these charming little rodents, um, hopefully before uh, a shorted owl quickly snaps it up. Um, and obviously your typical sort of songbirds as well, which are all over the island. And um, the wren in particular will hop around in between the nests of, of the puffins um, and the Manx shearwaters, the, the burrows, uh, and they'll sort of look for insects and things like that. So it's an amazing place, white throats galore, swallows everywhere. Um, it really is a truly wonderful place. This gives you an idea of the sort of landscape, so rugged cliffs and then uh, these plateaus on top, um, and you find the, the puffins all the way around the edge of the island. And right in the middle is our accommodation block. We stay in sort of the Wildlife Trust's hostel, which is very sort of basic, but perfectly suited for what we need. And it gives us completely free roaming uh, across the island. There is hot water in the evenings. You'll be pleased to know for a hot shower. Um, but there are shared facilities, which is important to state. But it's a really wonderful place and it is catered by us, but it's a self-catering accommodation, if that makes sense. Uh, and it really is a, a wonderful place. And this gives you just a, an idea of, of the accommodation, single beds, um, but comfortable and has everything you need. So once you've been there for a little while, you can then start to focus on the finer details. You can start to look at things differently. And um, hopefully something like this, where a puffin lands with fish and you're in the right place at the right time, in a beautiful environment to capture uh, a little bit of magic. Um, you can start to play with light behavior. So this one's just stretching its wings before it flies off out to sea um, and using the backlight to sort of create this angel effect almost around it. Um, and then 
really go for the birds in flight. Once you've nailed everything else, just focus on the birds in flight. And puffins, I can assure you, are seriously hard to photograph in flight. They're incredibly quick, they're small, and they don't fly particularly straight either. They're quite erratic with their aggressive turns and um, sort of swooping landings. So you have to have quick reactions and a lot of perseverance. And please don't think that I've just gone out and taken a photograph and then gone, oh, great, thanks very much. Uh, it takes many hours um, before you really start to see the results of your hard work. Um, and it really does take a lot of perseverance. So if at first you don't succeed, um, keep trying, try and try and try again. Uh, and, and really, really, really don't give up because eventually you'll get a, a cracker that you're you're really happy with. So I'm going to sort of just finish up now on something a little bit new. Um, and, and we're offering videography workshops. Uh, so we've got this beautiful uh, trip to the Cairngorms uh, and another one to Finland, actually, to one of my favourite places uh, in eastern Finland for, for the predators there. Uh, and they're run by a fantastic videographer filmmaker called Neil Aldridge. He's also incredibly well known for his conservation photography work. He's been a wildlife photographer of the year, uh, Monfoto, you name it, he's sort of had his work featured all over the place. Um, but he's a fantastic guy, really passionate and a brilliant filmmaker as well. And we have been asked a lot recently whether we offer videography, filmmaking workshops. And it wasn't something we ever felt we had the skill set in-house to do perhaps. Um, and so with Neil on board now, um, you know, we really feel we've got something to offer and um, that's really special. So if you're interested in video videography in particular, then these are the trips for you because they're designed specifically um, with you in mind. Um, so in the Cairngorms in particular, I mean, ospreys are undoubtedly one of the highlights. Um, they are obviously beautiful birds. And th these are photos, I've got a video that I'll show you shortly um, that Neil has put together. Uh, but it just gives you an idea of the opportunities that are available. So obviously, you know where um, the ospreys are coming using purpose-built hides. And you set up your camera, obviously, and Neil will talk you through everything you need uh, in order to get the footage you are after. Um, but these shots just, <coughs> excuse me, give you an idea um, of, of the sort of scene making that you can create. Um, and it is about sort of capturing... Um, more than a moment, obviously, you're capturing a sequence. Um, so it's a very different mindset to photography. Um, and that's something that Neil will be absolutely brilliant at helping you to achieve. Um, so that just gives you an idea of the incredible opportunities you get with the Osprey. But like all of our other trips, to be honest, there's so much more uh, to whet the appetite to, to get you excited from pine martins, um, just the most beautiful member of the mammal family in the UK, to badgers, one of our most charismatic species, and of course the red squirrel. You can't go to the Cairngorms and not spend time filming or photographing red squirrels. And there's a great hide which we use for this. We use it for photography sometimes as well, and I've been there a few times. Um, and it's perfectly designed for filmmaking or photography. It's got 180 degree viewing angle, squirrels all around you, and it's got heather all around you as well. It's just beautiful, absolutely amazing old um, Caledonian forest location. It's the perfect place uh, to spend some time filming these beautiful and rather cheeky little mammals. And there is also an area where they like to jump. Um, so you can capture footage of that too, uh, and even get some wide angle footage if, if that's what you're after. At any time, there's other things around from red foxes up on the higher levels, particularly in the summer months, um, you will get the deer. Uh, they sort of try and keep away from the mosquito infested, midgy infested valleys um, sort of and, and head up onto the higher ground. So you get these beautiful open vistas uh, and really, really incredible scenes and um, perfect for, for deer. Uh, and you never know what else might show up at any of the hides as well. So um, you can expect to, to really build a, a wonderful um, bit of footage up in the short time that you're with Neil up in the Cairngorms or, of course, in, in Finland as well. Um, and so I'm just going to leave you with a minute long video um, of this incredible sort of part of the UK that Neil's put together for us. So hopefully um, this will really whet your appetite uh, and encourage you, if you're interested in videography, to, to, to sign up.
Ooh, I'll stop that. That's not meant to play again. Sorry about that, everyone. So if you do have any questions at all, um, please do send them across. Um, we will do our absolute best to answer as many of them as possible. Thank you very much for Neil, um, to Neil for sending that lovely bit of footage there. Um, hopefully that really inspires you uh, to get involved. Um, and yeah, if you've got any questions, send them over. I think Dan will be launching a poll if he hasn't already. Um, reminder. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you, Fred. Yeah, there we please. go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and please do send over those questions and um, Dan will sort of hopefully be able to moderate. <laughs> Absolutely, Brett. No, guys, that was outstanding. Really, really was. Um, I never tire of seeing your images and um, it always kind of reminds me just how talented you are. So thank you, um, you know, sharing those images and also just for the, the insights and, and stuff with regard to the, the trips. Um, it, it's really valuable, you know, to, to everybody listening. So that was superb. And as you might imagine, we've had some, some lovely comments about the photography and some, some really good questions, I have to say. Um, before I crack on with them, I would just say on that video, I don't know if everybody else found the same, but it was a little bit jumpy for me. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to go and watch it, if you go onto the website and find that particular trip, it's actually in the image gallery and you can watch it there and it should play absolutely fine. But um, it's, it's a lovely set of footage that Neil's put together there. Right, um, I will crack on with these questions. Um, the first one relates to the Hampshire bird photography trip, uh, and it's from Fiona. So it might be a good one for you, um, Em. Um, and it was just regarding what lens you'd recommend uh, for that particular trip. Um, for the woodland hide, I would say probably, um, if you've got, I, I generally say, if you've got two camera bodies, then bring kind of those and a lens for each. Um, if you're looking for the, the closer stuff on the reflection pool, probably a 70 to 200 or similar. Um, if anything like the birds of prey comes, you probably want a sort of four to 600 ideally. Um, and any of the kind of birds in the willow bushes, things like that, that's normally kind of four to 600 as well. So two if you can, but um, somewhere around it, you know, I know a lot of people have the 150 to 600, which would be perfect. It does everything. Um, so yeah, anything like that really. Okay, and, and bridge cameras, uh, Em, as well. We've had a few people ask about whether they would be welcome on these trips if they've got bridge cameras. Uh, yeah. I try to reassure them that they absolutely would. Um, absolutely. And it's an increasingly yeah. popular option. Yeah. But... And I think nowadays more so, they're getting more and more um, advanced. And so I think some of them probably do more than mine. Um, but, you know, for example, I think there's the Sony R4, which a few people have brought along and they've brought the manual, which has probably been about this thick. <laughs> and we're sitting in the hide trying to figure stuff out. But, you know, there is so much that they can do. And not only are they really fast, so actually for the kingfishers, they're fantastic because you can sit it on, you know, you can fit it onto the, um, in the hides, you can have a gimbal head on a plate, which just sits on the shelf in front of you. So you can fit, as long as it's got the normal fitting in there, um, you can sit it onto that or onto a bean bag. Um, and exactly the same, as long as it's got a mode to be able to set it, you can do exactly the same as, as with a, an SLR. Um, and then obviously for the, for the birds, um, the garden birds and the kingfisher portraits, it's great because generally they've got a pretty good zoom in there. So as long as you're, you know what you're doing with it or we can figure it out together, they're absolutely fine. Um, and equally, I would say, you know, for the macro stuff, people have come saying, do I have to have a macro lens? I mean, yes, it helps, but if you've got a bridge camera with a macro capability or a, do you know, we had somebody on one of the workshops who brought their phone, but some of those, you know, you get those fit, mm. fitted lenses yeah. like a fiber yeah. from Amazon or something. Um, and it's got a, um, a macro one on there. And she got some incredible kind of wide angle fungi and some macro stuff from that. So it honestly, it's not all the gear, you know, you don't have to have everything. It helps, yes, but you know, also I'll have it, you can borrow it or see how it works. And then if you want to change, you can, if not, you stick with what you've got, but generally bridge cameras nowadays, as long as it's a, a newer one, I think the older ones, you'll find you can't do some of the stuff that you might be able, that you might want to do, but that's the only problem. They'll still work, you know, a camera works, does the same Brilliant. thing. Brilliant, that's, that's really helpful. Um, did you have a favorite um, lens from Macro? One of the, one of the guys did ask, um, um, I. Well, I'm what's a the best girl. lens? Um, yeah. So I, my 100 mil macro is one of the best things I've bought for my Canon. Um, so my, I tend to use my 300 mil 2.8 for most things um, and my 100 mil macro, which I've used since I got it 
10 years ago or more. Um, and yeah, I love that. So I would tend to go with that. I know some people use extension tubes and things, and, and I do sometimes um, on normal lenses, but to be honest, I just find it's it's so reliable. I love it. Mm -hmm. That's really handy. And Jackie also asked um, on the more technical side of things, whether you would cover um, focus stacking on, on yeah. each of the macro chip, you know, trips as standard, um, you know, whether that can easily be covered. Um, yeah, if somebody's absolutely. Really and especially, yeah. if, especially on something like fungi, it's mm -hmm. a really good place to do it or something that's sitting still. So as long as we can find something that's still, if you want to go through it, then we, yeah, we can absolutely talk through that. Great stuff. Thank you, Em. That's, uh, I may well come back to you. I've got one for Brett now, actually, because um, I, I did give Brett the heads up about this one, uh, just to oh, check right. that, he was okay, that he was okay to answer it, which he's assured me that he is. Uh, and it relates to the um, the red kites and night sky photography. Uh, we've got a gentleman, uh, Gary, and his daughter that are booked on that. And I'm going to read this as per listed here. Uh, and uh, it says, for the dark sky part, the itinerary recommends an f2.8 uh, 10 millimeter to 24 millimeter lens. Uh, we've not done night sky photography before, so not sure if the lenses we have are suitable. If we only have a, a 10 to 18 millimeter um, f4.5 to 5.6, will these suffice or should we look to buy or hire something else, possibly a 16 millimeter f2.8? Now that has gone straight over my head, um, but hopefully that means something to you, Brett, and, and to, to those other guys listening. Um, can you help? Looks like Brett can't help. He seems frozen. to have frozen. <laughs> <laughs> Are we just trying in the meantime? <laughs> but did, did you want to have a go at that, Em? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say they sound perfect. Really, what you want is a 2.8 is ideal because it'll let it'll give you the most um light, let the most light in. So that would be great. I don't think you need a 16. Oh, hello. We've lost him. <laughs> no. Um, I don't think you need a 16 mil if you've already got whatever it was, a 10 to something. Um, yeah, I think they sound perfect. Um, anything really with a kind of wide angle capability, you'd be fine. Um, you're gonna be doing it on probably 30 seconds or more anyway. Um, so as long as you've, you can get everything in, but I think Sean always um, also does panoramas. So there's ways of doing one shot and then stitching it with another one, something like that. Well, you know, if you don't have the capability with your lens, he'll work to whatever you've got, you know, you just, do what you can with what you've got but I think they sound perfect the ones you've already got so I wouldn't I wouldn't hire anything else for the minute. Brilliant thank you and thanks for stepping in there we, we do seem right. to have lost Brett um <laughs> that question clearly was too much for him <laughs> <laughs> um and, and we have subsequently lost our, our backing slide as well yeah. um I know I don't but I, I do just have a question uh, which I can probably help with and that's relation in, in relation to the videography trips and whether a simple SLR with, with video capability would, would be suitable for such a trip and I've spoken to Neil at length about this and he's assured me that it absolutely is as long as those you know you'll have a camera with you know video capability then he can give you some some fantastic tips and and, and set you you know on the right path with regard to videography um, so yeah it's really not a case of, of going out there and buying the most expensive equipment as long as you've got the basics we can we can absolutely work with that and if you are really worried or do have any like really specific questions we can obviously put that to, to any of the leaders um i, th I think we're, we're pretty much getting there with the questions now um we've, we've answered the majority um so hold on i'll just looks like we just had a couple more um sue uh, has just got in there with a i've just bought a mirrorless camera what lens do i need for macro photography for this please emma uh it depends what mirrorless one it is um if it's the canon one um i've just bought the same um and i'm actually i think potentially going to sell my canon 100 mil and change it for the mirrorless one which is making me quite nervous uh, <laughs> but i think i'm going to do it so i would say i mean any of the mirrorlesses you you'll probably have a um what's it called converter ring so hello <laughs> um, hey you'll probably have a converter ring anyway for it so you should be able to use a normal macro lens but I think if you've got um if you're able to buy if it's a Nikon or a Canon whichever or a Sony if you can buy the the macro for that normally it'd be 100 or 105 or 150 whatever they they do as standard I would say that'll be your best bet that's lovely thank you Em 
Um, it looks like we've just got one more question before we wrap up. Uh, I don't know, Brett, if you can chuck up the slide at the end of the presentation as well. Just yeah, sorry, my, my internet decided to die. <laughs> uh, we, we thought you just bottled it with the question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was it. I, I, just, I, I, I can't be bothered to answer questions anymore. I'm, I'm over. <laughs> no, um, and, and, M did a great job in your absence. Thank um, you, Emma. Sorry about that. <laughs> we, we have just got a quick question uh, from somebody who's remained anonymous. Uh, fair enough. Um, where in the Cairngorms is the photography trip based? Uh, and it's actually at Ballantine Lodge. Uh, we base ourselves there when we have exclusive use of that. And on the deer photography, they've asked uh, if they wanted to stay longer uh, at the end of the day. Um, if everybody headed off, would they be able to do that if they'd made their own way there? And, you know, I, I can't see any reason why not, you know, if the deer is still showing nicely. Um, I would say the only thing is that normally we finish when the light's sort of going. So, um, so you're there till the end anyway. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Because at that time of year, obviously, it gets dark that much earlier. So um, that's true. That's true. Um, but I mean, if you want to stay in the area, once you know where the deer are, then you're welcome to go back as long as you sort of follow, I'd say, our advice, obviously, how to approach them. Yeah. Um, we and, have and got really just, strict guidelines, haven't we, with regard to yeah. how we approach them, distances and so forth, which is yeah, all set exactly. up by uh, Forestry England. Um, yeah. So we, we work very closely with them. And, and that, that is closely monitored, which is really good. It, it, it's only right because, uh, unfortunately, you do occasionally get some cowboys um, who, who do push the luck and, yeah, yeah. make a bad name for everybody, unfortunately. Um, yeah, but no, guys, it has been outstanding. Um, thank you for, for a really lovely evening. Um, as I say, lots of lovely feedback, which you can have a look at later, uh, just to inflate your egos. Um, we have got a couple of talks um, in early March, uh, which I'd like to bring to everybody's attention. So um, we've got M back talking about primates on the 3rd of March. And then we've got Chris Breen, uh, the founder of Wildlife Worldwide, joining us on the 10th of March. And he's gonna be talking, us to, uh, talking to us about the Galapagos. Um, he was actually out there uh, it was just before Christmas. So he'll be talking about that trip and the trip that he's leading with Mark Cardine later this year. Um, but no, I think it's probably time to let you guys get on uh, with your evenings. Uh, thanks ever so much for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you next time we're, um, we're giving one of these talks. Thank you. Perfect. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.